Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank Neeta Sanjay and the entire team for having invited me to give a talk on parameters of longevity. And do we have the holy grail? It's something, you know, there are a lot of paradoxes in medicine. Dr. Arvind gave a wonderful talk. He said, you eat vegetarian food and your gut will improve. You know, I know friends of mine who come from the US who have been there for 10, 15 years. When they come with their children, my God, they want bisleri water, they want this, they want that. And thoda bhi kuch idhar udhar kiya ki they get loose motion, they get vomiting and they're sick because they have no immunity. Are apun to jake pani puri kha ke aata hai, wo bhaiya kidhar se dalta hai malum nahi, but that is what gives us the immunity. Now that is what the paradox is. Now let's see the parameters of longevity. Holy grail. What is holy grail? It's supposed to be that it carries the elixir of eternal life. That's the holy grail. It's the ability to give long life. You know, like they say in Amrit, you have Amrit and Marega in that kind of thing. It's a fountain of youth. You'll always remain young. But this is a myth. We are all going to, who are born here, will die. Life expectancy as birth has risen. Initially in India, early days, in the early 19th century, I think the average age of death was 40. Are people used to die of smallpox, cholera, famines, epidemics. Now all that is controlled. Infective diseases are controlled. Vaccinations have come. And people are becoming healthy. Today, Average Indian lives up to 70, 75, which is excellent, but it has its own consequences. So basically, abroad, it has gone up to 80, and, but the death remains more or less the same nowadays. So why do scientists want to see us stop aging? Because what aging does is, the reason is that they believe aging is the single biggest risk factor for diseases such as cancer. As you age, you get more cancer, Alzheimer's. In fact, yesterday I saw a very senior pediatrician. One of the topmost pediatricians of Mumbai was admitted under me in Lilavati. He was my patient with diabetes. He's demented. He's just 82. I mean, wonderful human being. But his dementia, his hands were to be, see, his hands were tied down because he was pulling out everything and he didn't even recognize me. Now, that is the impact. So you can get cancer, you can get Alzheimer's, you can get diabetes, you can get all the other complications that comes. And these conditions were less of a concern before public health initiatives like clean water, vaccination and everything. And now we live longer. So now these things are coming to the fore. So when you talk of a lifespan, whoever is born is going to die. And from birth to death, that is his lifespan. And there is something known as a health span. Health span is a period of time when we are healthy until we die. So that is the difference. You have to look at a lifespan and a health span. Can I have the slides? Mike Guma there, but slide me. Laptop display? Huh? Laptop display is there. Yeah, display is there. Hmm. Okay. 
All right, then I'll continue. So basically what we look at is lifespan and the health span. Now, as life progresses, at one point of time, the health starts deteriorating. And that is known as the onset of morbidity. And this point of shift, which is known as onset of morbidity, comes as you age. And on an average, it's about 55 years of age when the onset of morbidity sets in. And then diseases like cardiovascular disease, stroke, osteoarthritis, type 2 diabetes, dementia, Parkinsonism, movement disorders, and all start setting in. So most illnesses that we suffer from are chronic in nature and generally occur much later in life. The infective ones are earlier, but these are chronic, these are debilitating. Now, the basic concept now is, can we compress this morbidity? Your morbidity begins around 55. Could you compress this morbidity and increase the healthy lifespan beyond 55? So increasing longevity without increasing our health span would have serious economic consequences because as the lifespan increases and our comorbidities increase, it becomes a major health problem, financial burden on hospitals, societies, and the families. Taking care of invalid old people is a problem. the disease, treat the disease. If somebody has diabetes, you treat his diabetes. He has hypertension, treat his hypertension. If dyslipidemia, treat his dyslipidemia. And hopefully this will result in a longer lifespan. And we definitely have evidence for that. That if you adequately treat diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, you can increase the lifespan of that particular patient. Oh, wow. Now I can be seen at least. Are you going to What time is it? To hear you online, they were not able to see you. That was the problem. Yeah, no, but this time the light came, so again. Huh? Okay, okay. So what's happening today is that with modern medicines, with modern treatment for all these conditions. I mean, you have a coronary artery disease, you do angioplasty, you do bypass, you do redo bypass, you do redo angioplasties and you can prolong life. But prolonging life or living longer, we have opened ourselves to different suffering. Because since the onset of morbidity remains on an average 55 years of age, which has virtually remained unchanged from 1980 onwards. So just prolonging life is not the question. The question is how to have quality life. We still don't have this. So the compression of morbidity, this theory states that most illnesses are chronic, which occur later in life, and it has been postulated that the lifetime burden of illness could be reduced if the onset of chronic diseases could be postponed. Like for example, if somebody is likely to become a diabetic by 40, he takes necessary lifestyle precautions, diet, exercise, weight reduction, he can postpone the onset of diabetes from 40 to maybe 50 or even 60 or even prevent it. We have diabetes prevention studies which have been done. So that is where okay. ah. okay. Illnesses are chronic and occurred later in life, 
and postulated that the lifetime burden of illness could be reduced if the onset of chronic illness could be postponed. And if this postponement could be greater, that increases the life expectancy. Now, this is a schematic appearance of it. If you look at it, 55, 60, 60 is there, and that triangle that you see, morbidity begins around 55, 60, and death is 70, 75 to 80. Between that period is where all these chronic diseases come. If we can shift that morbidity from 55 to say 65 in the last thing, the healthy period of life improves. And if the healthy period of life improves, the further period could still be better. The chances of getting all those chronic problems could be much less. So as people live longer, some fear that they will spend additional years in poor health, disabled and demented. In contrast, the compression of morbidity hypothesis poses that people can have both a longer life and a healthier old age. That is the crux of the matter. To do so, it is necessary to postpone the onset of morbidity. So main thing is to postpone the onset of morbidity, which generally begins around 55, if you can pro push it back through healthy preventive practice and more rapidly than death is not going to be postponed, but you can postpone the morbidity. So while it is true that good preventive medicine, healthy lifestyle can postpone disability due to chronic diseases, there comes a stage in every person's life that significant illness-related debility is experienced. As you age, it is eventually going to catch on. But how much does it catch on? To what extent does it get in? That is where your compression of morbidity will play a role. As the illness progresses, it becomes a source of bio-psycho-social-spiritual suffering. Now, what is really aging? Aging is a persistent decline in age-specific fitness components of an organism due to internal physiological deterioration. And aging results from impact of cellular damage over time. This leads to a gradual decrease in physical and mental capacity, a growing risk of age research conditions, and finally death. Aging is a process that is different in every person, and it's a lifelong process. Actually, aging starts from the age of 20. From 20 onwards, your skeletal muscles start using less energy, get stored more in the fat. That is where it starts. So you need to start early to have a healthy lifestyle to shift your comorbid, compress your comorbidity. We should remember caring of the individuals, keeping this in mind. So aging is a complex process. Physiologically, aging is an accumulation of damaged and mutations at the cellular level, which is drastically decrease the function of our tissues and organs. One of the most obvious manifestations of this dysfunction is a loss of skeletal muscle. Most important, skeletal muscle, which typically takes a gradual decline after the age of 45. So there is a sarcopenia, and that is where the weakness comes, because the muscle is going. I'm not talking about the comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, or I'm just talking about a normal person who is aging. So the loss of muscle mass and strength that occurs with normal aging is referred to as sarcopenia. And why does this happen? Because, and this leads to a lack of balance, lack of stamina, inability to walk properly. You know, all these things come in with loss of muscle mass. And why does this happen? It's because of lack of proteins. But there is a plus factor here. There is a silver lining. We could change this. And how do we change this? Why do you get sarcopenia? Lack of exercise and lack of proteins. And if we give adequate protein and adequate exercise right from the beginning, you can make a huge change in the outcome. So when you talk of protein intake, Dr. Arvind said, you know, vegetarians have good, but, but vegetarian protein is not up to the mark. 
the biologically superior protein is your animal protein. So basically, generally we all say, you know, one, one gram per kilogram body weight is the requirement, but in these elderly you can give up to 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight. And giving that is a difficult proposition because in vegetarians it becomes difficult, but you can have protein supplementation. That is the easiest way to give them protein. And among this protein supplementation, whey protein, which, is, which comes from milk. Whey protein is a milk-based protein casein, which is good and it has been shown to improve the muscle strength and muscle integrity across the board. So basically achieving this kind of protein intake can be daunting because vegetarians hardly have any protein. So you have to give a supplementation. Nowadays you get good whey protein powders which can have in a scoop up to 15 grams of protein which can be given twice or thrice depending on his need which can cover an average person would need about 60 grams of protein in a day. If his diet is inadequate, supplementation can be done with a whey protein. Now, aging gracefully is most important that you have to stay physically active. A lot of studies have told us across the board, I won't go into the details, that exercise is the best. In fact, I tell my patients 40 minutes exercise. Like, you know, somebody who comes to me who is now, say, 55, I say, Tumko or Paat Sal Bachai. Basically, when I tell them, when you go, sir, doctor, time nahi hai mere ko. Mere ko time hai nahi hai. Mere time to milega tere ko. Abhi paach saal bacha hai. Saat hote hi, budapa shuru ho jayega. Aur tab agar fitness hai na, to aage ke 25-30 saal haste khelte jayenge. Nahi to bheek maagna chalu hoega. Mujhe pakado, mujhe uthao. This is ground reality. And this is the crux of the matter. And trust me, when I tell this and my associates also tell this to the patients in the same tone and tenor, it makes a huge difference. And they realize that what I'm telling is a fact. And I tell them, ki main jo bol na, usme aapka ek naya paisa kharcha nahi hai. Fayda hi fayda hai. Kharcha to khali mere energy ka aur aapko batane ke liye. So that sets the ball rolling and it makes a huge difference. Trust me, I've seen people who are, you know, bad, down, they really come up. So physically active is the most important. And a lot of studies have shown that regardless of age, having a physical fitness is worthwhile. This we have regular exercise. What you need is about 2.5 to 5 hours per week of moderate intensity exercise, 1.25 to 2.5 hours per week of vigorous aerobic and a combination of two. Basically what I tell my patients is go for a 40 minutes walk. You should do at least 150 minutes every week. 40 minutes walk and you do 10 minutes of some resistance exercise. You can get some spring or rings or bull worker or dumbbell and do some uthak baitak and along with this what is needed is mobility exercises. You know, flexibility, bending, getting up and balancing. Especially in the elderly, you find that they have a problem. So these are the exercises that need to be given to them. Mental health is very, very important. Very important. You should spend time with, you should have friends and family. I have a lot of friends who have the PICA syndrome. PICA syndrome is not the iron deficiency one. It is parents in India, children in America. And I have seen there is a depression with them. You know, they have not accepted the fact that they are alone. And that makes a big psychologically deterrent to them. They're depressed. They lose their initiative. 
to do anything active in life. So what you need is a good set of friends, good family background, which helps a long way in giving you a nice, healthy old age. That family support or relative support is very important. Now, there have been certain drugs which have looked at aging. Rapamycin, which is basically a drug which is given to organ, in organ transplant. And what they showed that in mice, they lived longer and were healthier. And that's very impressive. But then, they also suffered serious side cataracts, testicular atrophy and things like that, which is out. Then, Arvind showed about red wine. Red wine contains resveratrol, which is from the skin of that red wine, uh, grapes, and which has been shown that it could be used as a longevity drug. The French were very happy because the wines would sell. Red wines, French wines are the best. But then, if you have to really get the benefit of that, you are going to land up with cirrhosis of liver. You'll have to drink that much of wine to really get the therapeutic benefit. But this drug, metformin, has had a good track record. It has shown that in diabetics it reduces the risk of cancer, reduces the risk of coronary artery disease as shown by the UKPDS study. It has many other beneficial effects. It can possibly, it's weight neutral, but could help in weight reduction. The diabetes prevention program has shown that it can work. And it is a drug which has been used for donkey's years and in millions of patients and hardly any significant side effects except GI side effects. Metformin has also been shown to reduce the risk of dementia in patients with diabetes. But this is not really approved in a non-diabetic. Diabetic will obviously give metformin. But now they are looking at whether you could give metformin to elderly patients to make them age gracefully, prevent all these complications like dementia, cancers, and things like that. So there have been studies which show that it has an anti-aging property. In animal studies, especially in roundworm, what they find is when the roundworm is getting old, it shrivels up and dies. But if that roundworm is given metformin, it doesn't shrivel up. It is nice and healthy and lives much longer. And this has led to studies which probably show that metformin could increase the longevity. And there are some studies which are in the pipeline. This is the TAME study, targeting aging with metformin trial. And this is being done in the Scandinavian countries, they have probably got about 3,070 plus individuals, non-diabetics enrolled. They are giving about 1,700 milligrams of metformin to them daily. And they are going to see whether these patients, what happens to them over the years in terms of developing cancer, in terms of developing dementia, in terms of longevity of life and general health and well-being. So this is in the pipeline. And so if you look at metformin, it can treat diabetes, possibly dementia, cancer, Alzheimer's, heart disease. That is what today we are looking at. But we don't know. This is all in the pipeline. We, have, we can always dream of something good happening. But this is a drug which is absolutely safe that way. So the takeaway would be, See, getting old is part of living. We are all going to get old. But it is not the length of life that is important. It is the quality of life. So your comorbid situations begin around 45, 50. And if you can keep your system good right from day one, your exercise, diet, fitness, you are going to change that comorbidity, you'll compress that comorbidity, extend it from 45, 55 to 65. And that will give you a good health span of life.
life span will remain where it is but health span and that is what is most important so our goal in gracefully aging should be to improve our life span but to improve our health span today our society you know there is over consumption of everything see when i was a student we didn't have food we only had ration there was no mcdonald there was nothing you could not buy rice in the open market but today there is plenty and that plenty there is you just ring up zomato and you get what you want at 12 o'clock at night also because when my wife makes horrible food that is what i do so that is what life is but there is a over consumption and the right quantity of food and the right food is hardly being taken so the benefits of consistent exercise cannot be overstated make conscious effort to exercise regularly remember that aging is a marathon it's not a sprint it's a marathon it's you have to be slow and steady and consistency is the key so slow and steady wins the race you inculcate this habit of fitness a good protein diet weight reduction and you will live a nice healthy long life thank you very much ladies and gentlemen